didn't have any weapons. He went in with a Bible and a military knife. And that was it. That feels like something Jesus would have signed off on. Yeah. Oh, I think Jesus would have ripped in there on that Camaro. And yeah, given, just ridden with just, him. Just, <laughs> Jesus would have been his right next to him being like, we're doing this. Chain yeah, let's smoking. Go. <laughs> Welcome to 500 Open Tabs. I'm Hannah Hillam. And I'm Kava Taharian. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing, Hannah? Um, g- g- weirdly good. I- I- again. Really? Yeah. I did. I went camping. That's strange. I went oh, camping. Oh, yeah. That yeah. sounds nice. How found was your a camping? Frog. I found a frog. It was fine. That's cool. I like frogs. <laughs> it was by the beach. Camping's always fine. Although yeah, there was it's a foghorn. There's a foghorn in the background that went off all fog night. Foghorn leghorn? Yeah. It was him. <laughs> He's like, I, I do. I, do I know you're declare. trying to sleep there in your <laughs> sleeping bag. <laughs> but, 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 but I, I think that yeah, no, exactly. He talked all night. No, there was a foghorn that just went uh, literally every thirty seconds for twenty four hours. So I'm not insane. But... Great. Uh, and you've had a very productive week. You've been texting me a lot about how excited you are about yeah. whatever this tab is that you're going to do today. Yeah. Uh, so I'm excited to finally know what the shit that even is. Uh, well, hang on. What how are you? You can't just move past. You ask. It me doesn't how. matter. Yes, it does. I'm fine. Uh, I was going to say I'm. What's I'm new? doing well. <laughs> I'm really excited about our YouTube channel that people should subscribe oh, to because we do video. Yeah. Uh, YouTube. Yes. If YouTube. Yes. If you're listening to this, continue listening to it. But also. Yeah. You can watch it because mm-hmm. you can see the weird faces we make at each other and also the images we put up on screen. Long story short, we mentioned this before, but we have a YouTube. Yeah. We're trying to reach uh, a higher number of, of subscribers. Mm-hmm. So please uh, go Greatly do that. Greatly appreciated. If you can. So if you have a YouTube account, go subscribe. Um, but that's basically the only thing that's interesting in my life. Otherwise, the um, YouTube I'm account happy. is the only thing yeah. that's interesting. <laughs> oh. Nothing else. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we're getting ready for New York. Oh, by yeah. the time this comes out, we're only going to be a couple of weeks from or a couple of weeks from New York Comic Con, which we will be there. And I'll only be and... two weeks away from my book launch. So uh, yeah, lots happening. Lots going on. Cat people. Uh, which also we should probably mention at the top now is that uh, in the coming weeks, we will have some fun uh, oh, yeah. guests on the show because Hannah is going to be too cool for us. Yeah, uh, that's she's abandoning why. us for a book tour for a couple of weeks. So uh, we're going to have some fun people fill in. So keep your eyes peeled and your ears. Peeled. Peeled? Peel, peel your ears. <laughs> uncorked? <laughs> uncorked. Keep uncorked. your ears uncorked for the special <laughs> guests. <laughs> I like the idea that everyone's ears are corked. All the time. I mean, default. with headphones. Yeah, but with oh, headphones, that's usually right. what it is. Oh, yeah, remove I, the headphones. <laughs> so you can hear in the distance... That yes. my book is out, or that there's. Yeah. Sorry, I'm talking about my book. There's I meant guests that are guests. replacing you. It's fine. I can't be replaced. No, not at all. Uh, anyway, um, that's all the updates we have. Yeah. Why don't we get into it? I'm curious. Uh, what do you got for us? I know that you. I should have gone first, but for reasons whatever that obvious, I'm not going to go first this week because okay. first is the worst, as we used to say on the playground. Absolutely, and it's going to be so. Get ready. Great. Perfect. I, I shouldn't have hyped you up. Just put your put your expectations like down here. Well, okay? now you're all stressed out. Now yeah, I'm like, oh, of course you I am. You said, <laughs> why wouldn't I be? You're like, oh, Hannah's been talking about this all week, yeah. blah, blah, blah. and I'm like, oh, oh no. <laughs> literally I, because of the words that you said to me, which yes. is, I think this is my favorite tab I'm ever gonna do. <laughs> so no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So I gotta set the scene right. Okay. Before I can tell you the article. Okay. It is the early 1990s, and we are in... already love it. <laughs> it's, well, here's the thing about this story is that it's fraught, but it's real okay. cool. And okay. And it's the early 1990s, and it is the height of the, the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The Balkan conflict, if you know anything about it, you know, it's deeply depressing and complex and layered and can be looked at through many lenses of economy, ec- economic, like eth- ethnic, religious, and regional. And the mm-hmm. extremely watered down version is that the Balkan region has always been the meeting place of multiple religions and cultures and empires. And historically, nationalism wasn't really a thing. And they kind of, it was not until the 20th century when everyone started getting into like nationalism. Yeah. You know, like our favorite, horrible, my favorite, I mean, our least favorite people on earth, the Nazis. Wow. Hannah, Hannah, <laughs> Hannah Hill, I'm on the record talking <laughs> about our favorite nationalists. Uh, yikes. I should say, the most infamous being the Nazis. 
Uh, yes. They always make a. They always make an appearance. Um, always by you, by the way. I never. I just don't think point. that's true. That's a lie. I have. Yeah, you them bring them up multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> every story is tinged with Nazism. All right. Listen, they touched everything, everything in the in the 20th century. What are we supposed to do? Not talk about them. They existed. I'm sorry. They're so boring. Anyway, they really are. Okay, cook. Oh, we. Well, I don't want to talk about these guys anymore. Anyway, we're not going to this time. So Good. there were multiple different ethnic groups there and religions. So there was Croatia. There was a lot of Croatians who were Muslim and Christian and Orthodox. Mm-hmm. There were Serbians who were Christian and Orthodox, and the, then the Bosnians were majority Muslim, and mm-hmm. that was left over from the Ottoman Empire. And uh, after World War One, these ethnic groups started being like, "We want our own countries," and and decided to yeah. kind of break off into these separate countries. Croat- uh, Croatia? Dude, no, this, no. Is, this is also, of course, because the Ottoman Empire itself collapses. Collapsed, yes. The Ottoman Empire collapsed. This is around the time when almost every empire is kind of, in the cla- yeah. the classical sense of empire is collapsing. Like uh, mm-hmm. the British monarchy, the, the Britain is like, everyone's declaring independence. Anyway, so... The Qing Dynasty in, yep. uh, in China as well. Japan, too. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of this crazy worldwide phenomenon that you know monarchs and and empires like that are kind of falling. So thumbs down. Th- yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then, so now there are a few different countries, and then World War II rolls around. Uh, as it you know rolls around, it sounds so casual. Um, after World War II, everything fell apart again. They were kind of in mm-hmm. like shambles again. Hence, you know, everyone was, and. They united under a, a one name, which was Yugoslavia. And Yugoslavia okay. existed until the fall of communism. And this brought about the fall of many communist countries in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and nationalism again took hold. And what was formerly Serbia, they all freaked out and they were like, no, we got to stay as a country. Please, t- let's not do this. And they were also like yeah. the more violent of them all. And then um, Croatia declared independence and then this other countries declared independence. And then finally, a group called the Bosnians, Bosniak, they declared independence in 1992. And they were the majority mm-hmm. Muslim, and they also considered themselves Croatian and sometimes Serbian. So that's the thing with the Bosnians. They are a yeah. religious, ethnic religious group who are divided between the Serbians and the Croats, which makes it like this giant, like, tinderbox. It's complicated. Yeah. yeah. It's like, you don't know how to untangle it necessarily. No, no. Like- where do your taxes go right which who (laughs) yeah exactly and but the bosnians were like well we were kind of here like this was like our homeland so i think maybe we should yeah anyway so they invade sarajevo and then declare what's the word independence war independence and uh the rest of the world was like whoa guys hold on hold up let's let's chill and they are like did not hold up you know the serbians were Mm -hmm. like don't worry we got this and they proceeded to systematically and ethnically cleanse the bosnians over the next three years so if you want to be deeply depressed you can go read about it but we're not going to get into the genocide of this um yeah and i'm sure i i barely scraped the surface and it's just way more complex that is all to say all of this conflict resulted in a new sort of modern siege warfare that we hadn't really seen before which was uh, people were trapped inside cities, unable to move mm-hmm. from building to building because there were snipers everywhere. And mm. uh, yeah, so this you, is sounding uh, huh. yeah sounds a little bit hmm. familiar. Hmm. Yeah, um, it's not happening now. Uh, uh. Snipers everywhere. So leaving your house meant you for food meant you could possibly be shot in the street or death. S- yeah. Step on a lot in a landmine, and it happened all the time. And People would often be pushed to limits, eating dog food or drinking dirty water, uh, which led to illness mm-hmm. and death. It mm-hmm. was horrible. Like, it was horrible. And it was fully documented because we everyone had video cameras now, camcorders that yeah. they could easily access. Yeah. And anyway, medical aid wasn't available and neither was food because the Serbs or bandits would bomb or destroy or intercept any humanitarian aid. And the humanitarian yeah. aid that did get through was very sparse. So... For example, to, to to tell you how bad this was, the, the siege of Sarajevo lasted for three straight years. So there were people Jesus. in that city from day one for three straight years. And Ugh. it was three times longer than the Battle of Stalingrad in World War II. And uh, it was bad. So what was the result? What resulted was it an actual war on civilians and children because mm-hmm. that's what it was. It was 
Yeah. It was civilians, and uh, they all had to learn how to live in the shadows and survive. So that's the backstory. Sad. Okay. But don't worry, I'm about to pick it up a little bit, okay? Okay, good. So let's say you're in Sarajevo, okay? <laughs> and <laughs> you, you've run out of food. And you could risk going some to find something, but you'd be risking death. And uh, you decide, well, maybe I should just wait for humanitarian aid. But no, they were bombed. They were destroyed. Yeah. And you can see snipers on roofs. You can hear distant gunfire. You can see military outposts. You can see, um, like, almost like people film, from, like, forming their own, like, military units to, like, protect themselves. And yeah, you are in some bombed out house, right? Find Trying to find shelter. And you're starting to lose hope, right? And then... And suddenly, you hear a faint sound of an engine from the back streets. And with a whoosh, almost like a whisper, a 1979 dark gray Camaro rushes into view. (laughs) All right? (laughs) Okay. And you're like, what is this Camaro doing here? You run inside, lock the door, tell everyone to get down. You don't know who it is. Yeah. But no gunshots come. No one bangs down the door. Instead, you hear a man with a Danish accent announce that he's from the American military and he has supplies. So you open the door and you see this dude, kind of stocky army man, wearing studded studded leather gloves, night vision (laughs) goggles, (laughs) a Kevlar helmet, a flak jacket, with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. Okay? Yes. Love it. And he takes the cigarette out of his mouth and he's like, my name's Helga. And I have tons yes. of supplies for you. Sorry, I just need to go ahead and uh, buy the rights to this story right now. Too while late. I'm typing. <laughs> uh, I was like, this is fodder. Uh, Helga, I think Helga sold the rights to this like two years ago. Okay. I couldn't understand his broken English on Facebook, but I think because <laughs> you bet I went and stalked Helga. Oh, He's yeah, alive. Of yeah. Then Helga is like, well, I'm going to bring the stuff in. And he changes into civilian clothes because he sees there's children in there. And he's like, well, I don't want to mm-hmm. scare the children. Yeah. And so out of the back seat of his Camaro and the trunk, he starts unloading hundreds of pounds of food, water, yes. blankets, sanitary supplies, diapers, Lego, straight up Lego. <laughs> <laughs> this dude, Danish dude, comes in with Lego for the kids because... He got them to donate National it. treasure. Seriously. Right. <laughs> Danish Danish national treasure. And, He's an ambassador. <laughs> right. And he brings extra you know, clothing, anything people could need. Uh, yeah. Medicine, most importantly. And he sticks around and he plays with the kids. And then he gets back into his Camaro and he drives away into the, into the night. And Dude, this sounds like literally Santa Claus. <laughs> He's, I was just about to get to this part where I call him a post-apocalyptic <laughs> Santa Claus. All right? Because he... <laughs> As he drives away, you hear gunshots from snipers because, dude, these snipers know about this guy. And yeah. they they have spent the last couple of years trying to kill him. And they the, But the sniper bullets bounce off the car because guess what? That car is fully armored. Nice. And the armor plating that he installed is helping him a lot. And Helga then pushes the nitrous button and the car peels out at 400 miles, not 400 miles, <laughs> at 400 horsepower down the dark back roads of Sarajevo. It's literally like a Fast and the Furious yes. movie or something now. <laughs> but like hit the nitro. <laughs> boom. I'm, I'm obsessed with Helga Meyer. This man. <laughs> so all of that leads to me telling you the story of the Ghost Camaro and God's Rambo. Or I like to call him the man with the biggest balls in the Balkans. <laughs> so, Helga Meyer. Hold on. Do you yeah. plan on showing me any pictures of him? Shoot, I got so excited. Like, yes. Hold on. I got to send you some pictures. Hold I'm on. like, I'm so excited to okay. see what this man looks like I'm in obs- his car. I'm obsessed with this dude. Okay, here is... The biggest balls in the Balkans. The biggest balls in the Balkans. I'm going to send you a couple pictures of this Camaro. And there's Helga with his cigarettes, with his with his... Oh, God. He looks exactly what I thought yeah. he would look like. Yep. <laughs> Whoa. Just, they cool? Yes. That's all of his gear. And the Camaro, of course, has that intake on the front. This just uh-huh. looks like, like a Batman version of a Camaro, yeah. basically. But like an Eastern European war-torn Camaro. Like, it looks this so... This is legitimately awesome as shit. I'm obsessed with Helga. I... And it's all tinted black. It's the, all, this is, this is yeah. so awesome. Why does Hot Wheels not make a version of this? Here's the thing. I went 
I dug around. This story is not places. Like, I couldn't find it in any na- like news sources. I found his accounts of it, a book that he wrote in Dut or in uh, Danish, and a bunch of car blogs that like love cars. We <sighs> talk so about sick. it. I know. <laughs> okay. All so, right. so Go the, ahead. sorry, got I just really wanted to see what it looked like. Biggest balls in the Balkans. So Helga Meyer is a Danish special operations soldier who had fought uh, alongside American Green Berets and had been trained mm-hmm. by other special forces. He was in the Jaeger Corps, which was the Danish Green Berets, pretty much. He was a paratrooper. Okay. And one of his favorite pastimes was um, what he called his psychological walks, which meant <laughs> he would go on 100-mile treks and make it as hard as possible for himself. <laughs> this, this reminds me of my cousin Arya that we hung yes! out in New York where he was like, I need to walk 20 miles today Dude, around the entire island for fun. Arya was like, I walked 20 miles today. I'm like, <laughs> Why? He walked from Manhattan to Brooklyn to like, Har- no, to like up to Harlem. Like, I don't know. I don't get, I don't get him. That was my first impression of Arya. He was like, I've walked 19.5 miles. I got to get to 20. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Okay, and then we helped him finish. Yes, and then we all had pizza afterwards. We so everybody, to shout you, out to Zillions. It's delicious. We ate it, like every day. If everyone wants to know if genetics are real, they are because yeah. I met Kave and multiples <laughs> of his cousins who are all very similar. <laughs> We're all crazy. I love it. So, Helga, so hundred mile. 100 how mile often treks? would he do these hundred like, mile treks? A lot, and he would train other soldiers, and they would always describe him as like this quiet, like feelingless man who was like oh if you fail you fail go find the base yourself i'm not taking you back like stuff like that okay hardcore learned how to survive and also became very familiar with the balkans because he would go Mm -hmm. walking around there so he knew the cities just like on foot like you said yeah literally walking a hundred miles a day he probably knows all of it he knows and he knows the every climate he knows the culture he knows and a lot of people came out of that saying that was the hardest thing i've ever done and that guy was crazy. <laughs> so uh, he would, each person had 20 cigarettes, one liter of water, <laughs> and had to the make cigarettes it. are important. It's Dude, an important part of getting this, through it. This guy is a chain smoker, which just oh, makes course. it all better. Of course uh, he's chain smoking the entire time. And nobody was allowed to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like the Ron Swanson of the military. Yes. He's the Danish Ron Swanson, but like way cooler. <laughs> so yeah. he would go these silent psychological walks. Anyway, so that was one of his pastimes. Listen, this is one step removed from like a Buddhist retreat where you don't talk for 30 <laughs> days, but you're just walking for 100 miles. Through the Minus, Balkans. You take out the chain smoking, it's basically the yeah. same thing. Dude, I bet Buddhist, I bet Buddhist books chain smoke. I don't know if you're allowed to on the retreat. I'm not sure. Again, I have no idea. I hmm. don't know if like chain smoking is part of it. I know you have to like help prepare food and stuff, but I don't oh. think that chain smoking oh. is usually part of it. Boring. What's that Nigel Farage <laughs> video? Boring. Yeah, boring. Boring. <laughs> I hate that guy. Uh, I hate him so much. What a piece of, piece of crap. shit. Uh, when the Balkan conflict started, Helga was like, it got in his head. He was like, nothing's happening. No one can get in these cities. The world is just watching. I, I couldn't handle the idea of all these children and families just like starving to death. And he was like, I have to do something. And more importantly, God has called me to do it. And he he, lo- it's why he got the nickname God's Rambo, because he's pretty much <laughs> God's Rambo. Um, and he was like, okay, I have to figure out a way to get in there and get supplies because nothing's working. So he goes to the European forces and he's like, I have an idea. And they're like, mm-hmm. absolutely not. No. <laughs> We're not helping you. That's He's in- all, I got this Camaro. <laughs> yeah, no, really. And then he goes- You ever seen Batman? We're going to do that shit. We're going to do that, but it's going to be way more smoke filled. Yeah. Way, I was going to say way more chain smoking. <laughs> There's going to be smoking indoor and outdoor and all the time. <laughs> I need to make sure I got a cigarette lighter in this car. <laughs> the rest of it is negotiable. It's negotiable, but I can't. I can't not have a cigarette. Here's the thing. There's a good chance. Here's This guy's very active on the internet. So if you're okay. listening to this, Helga- I have the utmost come, respect for you. <laughs> please come be a guest on our show. We would love to hear your Salute, stories. Salute, dude. How is nobody... Anyway. <laughs> okay, so he, he'd been trained by the Green Berets, and so he knew mm-hmm. guerrilla warfare. 
he could he was a paratrooper he could he could easily get into the the, the cities yeah. and he had a specific knowledge of the back streets of Sarajevo and he figured with all that knowledge he could help not only did he know he could help but again he was like God is telling me to do it so I'm sent yeah. he goes to, and then he the European said no so that so that he goes to a humanitarian group and they're like no <laughs> we also don't know how you're gonna do this and finally you know who you talk to next. The Americans. The U.S. of A. Yeah. And they did not hesitate to say, yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> You're a lunatic, but so are you we. You son of a bitch, <laughs> we're in. <laughs> exactly. So they, oh, it was a resounding yes. Like, the soldiers, so they couldn't officially be like, hey, the U.S. military is backing you because that would create of course. some, you know, humani- not humanitarian, but like political issues. And so, Sorry, real quick. This yeah. is ninety three at this point. Uh, around ninety three, he did he did this all through the war. So, so this is, but this is decidedly during the Clinton administration at yes. this point, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. ninety two to two thousand. Yeah. Is it Madeleine Albright as the Secretary of State? I think. That right? she, yeah, that sounds familiar. Okay, I'm just trying to remember like who's in charge who of the what players here at this point. Yeah. yeah, who are the players here? Okay. Anyway, so the soldiers themselves independently raised $12,000 worth of supplies. And one of them before had... Kickstarter. Oh, How yeah. the shit do you even do that? They're Are not they... even like putting it up on the internet. They're like, they no. go door to door. They're like, hey, can you... Anyway, they had... So they had that, right? And then yeah. they're like, well, what car are you going to use? Because you can't like run around in there. And he's like, I'm going to use a Camaro. <laughs> a 1979 Camaro. That one. And some soldier had it or something. He somehow uh, obtained it from the U.S. military. And he got to work. So first, (laughs) I'm going to tell you. Is there any explanation about what his reasoning was for the Camaro as opposed to like Um, a Land Rover or something? I think he just liked it. Yeah, yeah. They're very fast and small and sleek and um, most importantly, American. Yeah, tough. Tough. Uh, Actually, I don't know if they are. Um, I don't know anything about cars. I'm car blind. So first, (laughs) he modified the stock engine with nitrous oxide. And he brought the horsepower up from 170 to 440. (laughs) So. Yes. Yeah. Then he attached Kevlar sheets to the back window and doors. He removed the indoor dome lighting. He painted the entire inside of the car black. He removed the. Oh, he uh, added a plow blade, an iron plow blade in the front of the car so that he could clear debris as he drove. I'm I'm curious as to what the do you know why he would paint the entire inside of it black? Is it just so that he can't be identified or like what is um, the It's just to blend in. Like if you think about it, something could glint off of light and you cuz he his whole oh, thing yeah, yeah, was okay. like That's a good point. Yeah. He wanted to But it's a Camaro. Slip. They're going to hear this giant ass like oh, I'll engine. get there. Okay. <laughs> so he did do he did do something with the engine to make it quieter. And oh, he did. Okay. Also, the tires. So the tires have are these special kind of tires that were like filled with like um, I can't remember what they're called, air flat tires or something. But they uh, they're quieter. And so okay, he was able to figure out a way to the, for it to only really be loud when he did the nitrous. With and the nitrous, okay. That was to just get out of sticky situations. Yeah, yeah. You know. So he um, I love him. I'm, I'm <laughs> I love this man. Um, and then he painted it infrared matte black the same paint they use for stealth aircraft so that it couldn't be picked up on radar or thermal amazing. scopes so amazing that's why they called it the ghost camaro because it could wasn't what a great name for oh, a car right so the good ghost, i'm gonna call my car the ghost camaro <laughs> even though it's not painted black or, or is it a camaro, camaro. <laughs> um he then added a military the ghost matrix actually that's a very cool name too that is is that you drive a matrix? That's awesome. You have a Toyota Matrix. Yeah, you know Ghost what? Matrix. There is a yeah. conflict going on right now, and you do have a <gasps> That's car. True. I'm gonna come in with a Toyota <laughs> Matrix. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All four cylinders and 1.8 liters. <laughs> it won't go fast, but it's gas efficient, You're and it's got a hatchback. Immediately murdered. Immediately Just killed. Dead. <laughs> immediately killed. Uh, so then he installed a military GPS system a fire suppression system, a thermal detector so he could see where people were in buildings. I, this is he's just literally Batman. This is literally yes. the Batmobile. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he also did a ground-to-air radio to be able to communicate with aircraft. And finally, 
The last touch was a rubber ducky on the grill because he wanted it, it to have. Nope, it was yellow. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I love it. The yeah. one pop of color. The one pop of color. And um, next he needed armor because he wasn't about to. Here's, here's the thing about Helga. He didn't have any weapons. He went in with a Bible and a military knife. And that was it. So he was pre-religious, it sounds like. Yes, yes. Going he in was... with the Bible, like loving, like seeing like I'm sent by God. Yeah. I'm sent by God to do his work in this area, yeah. but really hardcore. So I he mean, only brought a knife. doesn't sound wrong to me necessarily in terms no. of like what you should be doing in terms of like what the, the spirit, know, the good spirit of religion is. is whatever to works. People so that they don't get killed. It, feel, it feels specifically Christian. Like, mm -hmm. like as what it should be. Like, oh, yeah, people I was are like, suffering. That feels like something Jesus would have signed off on. Yeah. Oh, I think Jesus would have ripped in there on that Camaro. And yeah, given, just written with just, him. <laughs> Jesus would have been his right next to him being like, we're doing this. Yeah, chain let's smoking. Go. <laughs> yeah. Chain smoking with him. <laughs> just toss it, multiplying all the fish and loaves for everybody. Yeah. Wearing, wearing studded so leather gloves. Knife. Just a knife and a Bible. And that's why they, you know, called him Rambo or what was it? God's Rambo. Love it. God's or in Rambo, German, yeah. Go I think it's Gotter Rambo or something. Gotter Rambo. Uh, also a cool name. He had an army issued knife and he considered his faith and his dedication to this enough. And he also didn't believe in murdering anybody because that was, you know, which is interesting because he yeah. is a soldier. Um, he brought basic tools. Well, maybe it's like an because he's a soldier that he doesn't like murdering. He's like, I had to do enough of it and I don't yeah. want to do that anymore. I could easily see that. Yeah. So he had basic tools like an axe, fire starter, et cetera, but no real weapons. Mm -hmm. And he was like, well, I got to protect myself. So he got himself a Kevlar helmet, a bulletproof mm -hmm. vest and flak jacket, studded gloves, and pretty much just dressed himself like a hardcore biker wearing Kevlar. He, uh, over the next few years, Helga completed over a hundred missions nice. on his own by himself with the help of the supplies from the U.S. Army. In daytime and nighttime. So he started being like, okay, nighttime's not enough. I'm just going to go during the day when everyone can see me. And giving away little... Oh, I see. Yeah. This makes sense why everything would have been black then. He was only doing it at night. working yeah. at nighttime missions. Okay. And I, yes, that makes much more sense. He had... The, the car was so good at... Like, he could easily, like, pull into the city, get into the city, and hide the car in the rubble and make it look like it blended in. It was small, gotcha. compact, and then he was able to, you know, go house to house or whatever. Uh, like I said, like you said, a post-apocalyptic Santa Claus uh, slash yeah. Mother Teresa, who's actually <laughs> nice. I don't know. He was shot at, chased, never captured. After a while, everyone knew about him, including the soldiers. And they were like, this, the guy in the Camaro, kill him. Thorn in our side. Three years, not a single shot hit him. That's awesome. I know. It, one went over his helmet and like skimmed it. And then one mm -hmm. time he had to like dodge an explosion, but he did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just dodge an explosion. Yeah. There was pretty much an open warrant to kill him on site. He even worked after the war was over. So he did this all through the war and helping. Re he ended up helping rebuild the city and help bring supplies still into it. He did, did, not, did not stop. Dude, this car is so cool. Yeah, it really is. And the man. The man's cool too, but I'm obsessed with the car. Anyway, he he's yes, still alive. By the way, if you're uh, yeah, don't forget we are on YouTube. If you are on YouTube, you can watch this. You on need YouTube. to. I was about to say you can see these car, this car and all this stuff. It just you, literally looks you like you got to look at these pictures I'm about to put up because they here's him handing toys out to children in the daytime. Yes. Yeah, and then uh, here he is. I think after the war, I'm going to send you a couple. Yeah, I think it's funny that he's not in that photo. They're just kids like looking in his trunk. Yeah, they're all getting there stuck out is. of his truck. It looks like he's by the mystery mobile. <laughs> yeah, he does. He's like parked in front of the mystery mobile in the first one. <laughs> it's covered in dirt. Oh, it's just it's been it's very dirty. But you can totally see like, oh, this one doesn't have the like um, the iron. Oh, there's the plow. one that's in snow. Yeah, so he did like it was snowy sometimes. He did this year round. This and thing should be like at the Peterson Museum. I in know, LA. Like, right? The car museum. I feel like it would be really cool. It's in to his see garage. This in real life. <laughs> he still has it. <clears throat> he should donate it, especially he if he did it like on on behest of the Americans. The Americans right. would be inspired if they Dude, see it. Dude, I would love to see this car in person. But nowadays, oh, so sorry. Even after the war was over, he still helped, and he called his car his trusty war horse, which I think is metal and awesome. Yeah. 
And nowadays he lives in Germany. He's in his 70s. He got mm-hmm. married and his wife hates his car. She's like, you're obsessed with it. <laughs> She's like, I'm sick of this car. Why is it taking up space in our garage? And he's like, I'll never get rid of it. I was um, like, who is this wife that doesn't oh, appreciate this? Yeah, I'm sorry, lady. No, no offense, but, you know. But maybe Listen, have some not respect one to judge for your marriage, the car. But yeah, exactly. The car that saved all these kids. Like newborn babies got food to yeah. them. Anyway. Um, and he recently painted the car bright orange. Of course <laughs> he did. And everyone, what? I don't so I'm going to send you a picture of him posing in front of his bright orange Camaro oh, no. now. Yeah, everyone I'm was scared. like, why'd you do this, dude? And there have been like, he's been kind of like, people have been like, well, he's kind of playing up his story a lot, but. No, he's he's defaced He defaced monument. it, yeah. But look at him. He's wearing he's, the gloves, uh, though, which I like. He looks like a gloves. Mad Max character. He really that, like, does. Especially when it's orange and he's wearing the studded <laughs> gloves and he's got his sunglasses on. If you he want to see like it, he's all, hey there, Max. Hey. <laughs> um, Furiosa. So when the war, <laughs> exactly, when the war broke out in uh, in Ukraine a few years ago, yeah. he was like, I got to do it again. I'm back. And yeah. his wife was like, no. <laughs> no, you're no. 70 years old. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're 75. You're not doing this again. And he was like, you're right. Um, but... <laughs> He said if he could pull it off, he would. Uh, and I want to end on this quote of his yeah. that I thought was really great. He says, I want to tell you that it is useful to do something, even if you're alone and the circumstances are fatal. And you don't have to drive a Camaro into a war zone filled with medicine and toys for children. <laughs> I could do that because I had the military training and my special connections. It's about helping out on a daily basis down to the smallest thing. We can all do something to help others. So I thought that was pretty cool, and uh, I'm Listen, also obsessed with just, him. Let's take a minute to uh, to examine that beautiful statement of of masculinity, <laughs> of just like you don't have to be yeah. like a dude who runs into the right. into the war zone and gets shot at to be like a person that matters. Right, you can just do what it is that you can, even if it's small, and not doing anything uh-huh. is worse than at least doing something, no matter how small it is. That's a good mm-hmm. message. I really, I endorse that. I feel like Use that's the that. kind of shit that you don't hear as much as we should these days. Use that for whatever is happening in real life, you know? Yeah. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. So that's Helga Meyer and his ghost Camaro. Literally just the coolest name ever. I know. Like, <laughs> Helga Meyer and his ghost Camaro. I found him on YouTube. He has a YouTube account and he's always leaving oh, the most. Does he do interviews? <laughs> Nobody comments on everyone's videos they make of him. That's why... I'm oh like, yeah, he's gonna yeah. hopefully tag. He's gonna. Uh, yeah, and so I wanted to. Re- There's I'll, maybe later I'll do it. But he he writes, <laughs> he writes some really unhinged, not unhinged, but just like very boomer responses to things. <laughs> like, oh okay, but n- not curious. boomer, not boomer in the bad way. Boomer in the way that's like, oh, you're trying. You're seventy. You're seventy five <laughs> yeah. years old. You're seventy five, and you, you are anyway, and it's sweet. That's Helga. Thanks for listening. Awesome. Yeah, no, what a cool, what an interesting person who clearly deserves to have his own movie. Uh, not just movie, but, you know, I think we need to be selling those cars. I yeah. think the car needs to come to the Peterson, the Peterson Museum in, in L.A., which, if you've never been, is a really super cool museum. Um, One of my favorites. Black Mom. It's a very cool museum. Yeah. Uh, it would fit right in. It Again, really Again, especially would. next to like the Mad Max cars and stuff. Oh my but gosh. like an actual, like in a DeLorean or whatever. Because this guy like, was- Here's one that's in real life. Did not mess around. He was fully prepared to die every time he went in there. You, so you're saying that people are saying that he's exaggerating his story. No, not exaggerating, but they're like, oh, you're trying to make money off your story? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> like, that's I, not I'd why I did it. I'd be okay with that guy getting a little bit of cash. Yeah. But yeah, that's fine. I'm like, if he did something cool, if he's like broke. Like, yeah, he didn't do it him... for the money. He did it because he, right, right, right. God told him to. Listen, like you said, he's boomer trying to like exist in the year 2024. Yeah. Everyone's got to have a side hustle. If yeah. you gotta, if your brand is that I'm the post-apocalyptic, uh, post-apocalyptic Santa Claus, mm-hmm. by all means, go ahead. I think that's a good. There yeah. are worse things yeah. to try and capitalize off oh, of rather yeah. than trying to help ch- women and children who are starving in a war torn <laughs> right. zone. You know, it is shit. Everyone siege city. Get yeah. over it. You think he was like, can't oh, cool. wait till they make a movie of yeah. this. No, dude. Oh, he you eat at restaurants? Out. No, right. this guy deserves something, not you. Right. He's yeah. got a Bible. Oh, I forgot to say that whenever he completed a mission, he would 
color. He would paint the edges of one page in his Bible gold. And he was he was trying to fill up the whole Bible. <laughs> I love this guy so I much. I love him. I, I go on a deep dive. There's so many videos. There's so many comments he's made on the videos that are just endearing and amazing. <laughs> <laughs> like he comes in and like makes corrections and he's like, No, actually I owe it all to the American military. They I wouldn't have done any of this without them. But in like very broken English. <laughs> that was, like, Listen. <laughs> Sincerely, if he does, if you do comment on this video yeah. and you do come across it, please reach out to us. Yeah. 500 open tabs at gmail.com. We'd love to talk to you. We would love to talk to you. I think our audience would love to hear from yeah. you and just whatever insane stories you have. That would be such a treat. We, I respect everything you did greatly. Yeah. Anyway. Wonderful. Well, that, yeah. was, that was fantastic. That was a really good story. You were right. Yeah. That was one of the more my, crazy and interesting ones. I think it's ones one of my found. favorite things I've ever, like, I couldn't stop reading about it. I was like, yeah. Up till one, I was like, okay, I have to go to sleep. I'm not even doing anything. I'm just reading more comments. And like, anyway, the article I got it was from was called uh, a place called motorpunk.co.uk. Motorpunk.co.uk. And, uh, yeah. and it was written by Steve Swanson. And it's a car club website. Swanson. And, uh, I love it. <laughs> I love uh, I love how much people love cars so deeply. I learned a lot oh, about yeah. nitrous and stuff like that. Anyway, car what people do you have? are extremely into cars. I love them. Um, okay. Uh, funny enough, uh, it's not too, I mean, it's this is sort of like the yin and yang of, of what you're talking about. So mine, oh. mine is about, and I'll explain. So this tab is, a, it's about a dude uh-huh. uh, playing a dude <laughs> disguised as another dude. <laughs> what is that from? It's from uh, Tropic Thunder. Oh, um, yeah. Anyway, so despite loving science fiction as a genre in film and comics, spaces which I also contribute to, uh, yeah. sadly... My literary knowledge of science fiction is a little bit limited. Same. Um, I tend to only really know like the Hall of Famers, like mm-hmm. uh, Asimov and Bradbury or whoever, e- neither of which I really like to read, to be honest with you. Like, Same. A lot of old um, science fiction novels are tough for me to get through, which is not uh, mm-hmm. to say that they're bad. It's just harder for me to get into them in that sense. I have a hard time holding foca- focus on books, which sucks. I used to be able to like, um, zip through books, but now I'm like, oh, I can't get through it. Anyway, go on. I can I can read certain books. I find some of it just ends up being a little bit like, kind of detached a in lot. the way that it's written, mm. which again, that's fine. That's just my own personal preference. Not yeah. to say it's good one way or another. But so apologies to all you sci-fi people out there. Uh, that, hopefully that's not sacrilege, but I'm not familiar with the stories of today's subject, or I was not before this. However, his story uh, is nevertheless fascinating. Cool. So back in the 1950s and 60s, a man named Cordwainer Smith. That's right. It's Cordwainer Smith. Cordwainer Smith? Cordwainer Smith. That is a very specific. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know how people are like, I'm I'm a tailor. So my last name's Taylor. I'm a Smith. Cordwainers were people who like, I think made clothes or something, right? Shoes. I don't know. Shoes. Yeah. Cordwainer Smith. Oh, I'd call him Cordwainer. Cord wiener, that's what I was telling Sarah about this last night. And she's like, cord wiener. And I'm like, yeah, he's got a cord for a wiener. <laughs> yeah, it's disgusting. Cord wiener Smith. <laughs> <laughs> he t- takes it out. It's d- repulsive. Anyway, <laughs> everyone hated him. Cord wiener Smith. Uh, no, cord wiener Smith was revered for his thoughtful, oh. pro- thoughtful approach to the genre, earning him Hugo and Nebula nominations, as well as many devoted fans. But... They were all of them deceived. Oh, what? For another identity was made. <laughs> oh, nice, 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 l- nice bringing <laughs> Lord of the Rings fantasy genre into this sci fi discussion. Cordwainer Smith was not who he claimed to be, which writing under a pseudonym isn't uncommon for writers, but Cordwainer Smith, who was born Paul Leinbarger, <laughs> which is an equally weird name, but he so chose here we are. the name Cordwainer? I think to him it was it was just like you said. He's like I, uh, I Cordwainer is somebody who like constructs shoes and <laughs> and shoestring and leather and stuff. So he's like I'm like a maker of stuff. So I'm Cordwainer Smith, that was his pen name. Um, anyway, Paul Leinbarger was a man who, when he wasn't writing uh, science fiction, uh, he was a man with a long history of working for the CIA what? and a man whom some believe unintentionally invented the form of conspiracy theory that we grapple with today. What? <laughs> Wait, did the CIA even exist in the 50s? Uh, I think it was sort of coming of age at that point. Yeah. 
Whoa. I know one place that the CIA went in the 50s. Oh, yeah. Uh, but it was like 30s and 40s, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I can think of one that has. They're uh, kind of you know, all over. They got their cores kind of, in everyone's wainers. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I, can't remember the, I don't remember the exact year that the CIA started, but it was definitely yeah. happening in the 50s. Um, anyway, I'm going to say this up front, that this guy is like super fascinating to me. And if anyone wants to give me money, I will make a feature documentary about him. There's so much to explore in regards to a really interesting character study. But there's also cool. like this cross section of global politics and this oh. like dorky world building science fiction author. <laughs> Just give me money and I will make this. For Com- anyone who's listening. What, what combo of person is he that makes, you yeah. know, the, like the crosshairs of all these things make this one person wild. Um, so anyway, I'll get into this and you're going to love this just right off the bat. So okay. let's let's talk about Pi- Paul, sorry, Pine, about Paul Leinberger. So Paul was born into a family of government service. Oh. And at the turn of the century, Paul's father, Paul Sr., hmm. was a cavalry lieutenant in the Spanish-American War. Whoa. Uh, his focus was Spanish law. And he was very good at it. Uh, and it even earned him a nickname from his son as The Judge. That's the how he ju- referred to his father. <laughs> the Judge. Dude, that's a he great name to put in your phone when your dad calls. <laughs> the Judge is calling. The Will judge you is answer? Calling. Yeah, even when he wrote about his father, he'd always be like, The Judge this or The Judge that. He wasn't even Yikes. like, Yikes. Dad. Yeah. I'd love to psychoanalyze that. <laughs> <laughs> So this reputation earned him an appointment as one of the first U.S. Ju- judges in the Philippines, oh. which was a newly seized American colony at this time. Yeah. So we're talking early 1900s. And it was there that Paul Sr. met uh, Sun Yat-sen, which I tried to look up the exact pronunciation. It's uh, Sun Zung Zun. Is it China? Would, what, what is that? Never mind. He was to... the man who would go on to lead the revolution that overthrew the Qing dynasty and became yeah. the first provisional president of the Republic of oh China. Oh, my gosh. That's why I was referencing the Qing dynasty earlier oh, when you were talking. Uh, I was on. like, oh, funny enough that you were talking about nationalism. I want to try to and figure like, out how it's pronounced. I, I watched a YouTube. It's Sun Zung Zun, Zun, I think. Sun Zung Zun. Sun Zung Zun. Uh, anyway, he met the guy he... who would go on to overthrow the Qing dynasty. <laughs> Um, Wild. Interestingly, uh, I don't know anything about him, about um, about Sun Yat-sen, but he became, like I said, the first provisional president of the Republic of China. And he's somebody that uh, is recognized both like in mainland China and in Taiwan. Oh, like he's somebody that people are still like he's kind of OK on everyone's on everyone's books because he was the person who sort of ended the previous dynastic tradition and ushered in the modern era of china i love how many um, parallels there are with my story right here with the yeah the yeah it sounds like oh it's and, interesting yeah why does it always happen i feel like that happens a lot camels joe, yeah exactly <laughs> joe Cam- and alligators alligator joe camel anyway yeah anyway so at the time that paul senior met son he was still a young whippersnapper looking for support and cash from chinese expats to lead his revolution he was not yet the Whoa. man that would do all of that uh, he wasn't the guy you read about in all the history books. Listen, I'm, I had to stop myself from going to read all about the China Chinese Nationalist Revolution. It's sad. <laughs> admittedly, didn't know much about it, but I knew about the the Civil War a little bit, but not so much the first revolution that happened then. Anyway, oh, maybe that's, that's what I all, know about too. I don't yeah. think I know about the. Oh, interesting. Anyway, so that's an aside. I decided not to do that, so I was like, I'll stay focused on the actual tab and continue the story. So Good job. now, Hannah, much like you and young Stalin. Paul oh, Sr. was boyfriend? absolutely captivated. <laughs> <laughs> my historical boyfriend. <laughs> I think we mentioned this on the Q&A, not in the episode. Yeah, but I had a we need biography context. Of, yeah, I had a biography of young Stalin at my house. And there's a picture of him when he's younger. Uh, so and hot. And I came into the house and was just like, who? Oh, my God. He is so gorgeous. He is. Like over him. We'll put him up on the YouTube. Go look at it. <laughs> he's Look, if he didn't go on to like cause the deaths of millions of people, you know, it'd be different. Like, uh, <laughs> but look, if I just look at him in a vacuum, just that one picture, I'd be like, <laughs> "You're like all objectively yeah. a hottie." I, objectively, I would follow you into to like into a revolution. <laughs> um, <and laughs> speaking of which, Paul Senior totally captivated by Soon. He really believed in this man, <laughs> Whoa. not in like a sexual way, like you. But fine. Uh, he <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we don't know that. That's true. Could, there's no proof of that, as far as I know, that that wasn't the case. My but fan he, fiction he really, is, is that they yeah, right. Oh, I can see some good love. fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> but they couldn't. They had to focus on the revolution. 
So remember, he's not part of, he's part of like this thing. Uh, he's a judge, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's a US judge in the Philippines. He meets soon and he's basically like, this dude is super awesome and on the level. And I like, I want to subscribe to your newsletter and everything you're talking about is <laughs> Follow like- Follow you on Instagram. Like and subscribe. Yes, I'm super into it. He loves him. Swipe right. Swipe right. He believed in this man and his ambitions and his vision of how the world could, nay, should be. Oh. And he believes in him so much that in 1907, Paul Sr. resigned his judicial post to become Soon's legal advisor and financial Whoa. backer. Well, that's, he that's goes all big in. time. Yeah. This uh, military, former military, serving in the military, American judges, is like, that's it. This is my new life. This is what I'm going to do now. This this episode is full of idealism. It really of, is. Of oh, it's, it's going to get even more. <laughs> like core ideal, ideal views of, you know, vastity. Yeah. Okay. So Paul Sr. goes on to become responsible for some of nationalist China's most circulated propaganda. Uh, as a way to try and unify the people. An American dude? Um, I don't think that, I don't necess- I, again, I didn't go too far into the history of that. I so I don't you. know if he's, I think he's just sort of like consulting. He's he's there, but he's part of like the, almost like the inner circle. So in June, 1913, Paul Sr. sends his pregnant wife to Milwaukee <laughs> so that their child would be born a natural born American citizen and could one day maybe become president. Maybe. She president Godwainer. Gardweiner. <laughs> and when his mother brought him back to China, so at this point they leave the Philippines, they go to China. So he yeah. brings his mother brings back the child from China. And the child's name is Paul Myron Anthony Linebarger. It's a lot. And yeah, it's a long name. It's a mouthful. So this is this is now our this is now our focus is Paul Paul Jr., like little Paul, okay. mini Paul, whatever you want to call him. So Paul, when he gets to China, is christened Lin Ba Lo. Or wow. forest of incandescent bliss. Yeah. Wow. As he was now <laughs> the godson of Sun Yat Sen. No! So literally the serious? president of China becomes <laughs> this dude's godfather. Dude, you know I have a Taiwanese godmother. Do you really? Yeah. She came to my wedding. Uh, yeah. I don't I don't ever talk to her, but just so like she's not like pr- a president of like the country. She's not the president of Taiwan yet. <laughs> This dude literally just like dad decides to go join the cause. And then he's like, cool, the president's your godfather now. That is wild. Paul Sr. was in constant service of Soon's ambitions. So, of course, mini Paul, he's like moving around a ton as a kid. He's attending more than 30 schools as they bounced around the globe. As someone who also attended a bunch of schools. No, oh, sorry. Sorry yeah. for you, kid. This this was not this was not great. It's not like he's going to all these schools and like, you know, it's not like now where you can meet someone once when you're like backpacking in Europe mm-hmm. and remain friends with them on Facebook for the next like 15 years. Right. And and phones aren't even really like a super widespread no. thing at this age at this mm. time. Not till like the 20s and, do they really start getting yeah. into houses. He's seeing a lot of the world at an age during a time when that was not common, which is cool, but dude's not forming any long-term relationships. Yeah. Like that's just not happening with him. Um, and on top of that, he's he's a sickly kid. He's getting sick a lot. <laughs> Poor this kid. Recipe for yeah, this is a that's recipe. literally the note. <laughs> this is a recipe for an interesting life. One more thing. Oh. At one point, I think it's when he's in boarding school in Hawaii, which is one of the many places garden? that he's gone. Sorry. No, worse. Uh, <laughs> something happens. He pokes his eye out. No. And it gets all infected and oh. needs to replace it with a glass one. <laughs> that is so gross. So he's a sickly, one-eyed <laughs> expat <laughs> who's only like who's, 10? Who's like, I think this is all before he's 15. Yeah, who's grand, <gasps> whose godfather is the president of China. The president of China. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and somehow I'm remembering he goes on to write science fiction novels. So he goes on to do what all weirdo bedridden kids have always done throughout the history of time. Can I guess? He reads a lot. Oh, oh sorry. I was going to say world build. World build. That's also part of it too. Yes. But he reads a lot. Right. Anything and everything. And more uncommon for someone like him, like a young white American kid, he's reading Chinese classics like uh, Journey to the West and Romance Whoa. of the Three Kingdoms. He's like fully steeped in all these different things. That's cool. Uh, and of course, eventually he starts writing his own stories. And at age 15, he first uh, publishes a story and it's a, and it appears in the June 1928 issue of the Adju- Adjudant, Adjudant, 
Adjudicated. Adjudicated. Oh, it's a it's weird like word. adjudicated, I think. Uh, published by his high school cadet corps in Washington, D.C., which again shows you like China, D.C., Hawaii, mm-hmm. like all throughout Europe. Like kids just like seen so. Speaking of world building, he's seen a lot of the world. He's seen so many different kinds of people and places. Yeah. That's yeah. That's great. Crazy. By the time he's 15. Um, so this story, the one that he writes when he's 15, he would later go on to rewrite and retcon this as part of an anthology, which I will explain later. Cool. By 23 years old, uh, Paul was awarded his doctorate from John Hopkins in political science, which okay. is very young. Sorry to, to pause PhD. you again. Um, yeah. This is also very like parallel to my family. My Is it really? My grandpa was also in the CIA. And you never told me that. I know. <laughs> Spoiler alert, it's come out on the podcast. Well, he's dead, uh, you know, so he can't. There's no more secrets. Also, it was a really boring job. He just translated Chinese newspapers into English and then matched them up with license plates in Vietnam. Listen, that's what they want yeah. you to know. That's what the story that's that they the tell thing. you. But he was in the CIA. Uh, he was also a political scientist with an emphasis in Asian studies and Asian re- uh, political relationships. I guarantee you he knew who this guy was. Oh, probably. 100% knew who this guy was. And my dad, by the time my dad was 18, he'd lived in Taiwan, England, Austria. He would, they, they were always everywhere because they would study abroad and he'd just take his kids with him. So this reminds me a lot of like my, my dad's family where... That's my, cool. my dad will be like, oh, yeah, I got that in this city in China or in Hong Kong. And I'm like, what? When what? were you there? Yeah. He's like, oh, I don't know. I was like 10. I don't know. <laughs> like, okay, dad. <laughs> Which He's is why sure. I, okay. when we moved to Taiwan as a kid, I my yeah. passport was filled with more stamps than I've ever had since. I was one. Yeah. Thanks, parent, thanks mom and dad. <laughs> anyway. so well, I, you didn't get a chance to absorb all that I culture didn't get to absorb as, the as culture. like a 10-month-old. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I love hearing this because it, it just feels very familiar. Yeah. Anyway, so um, it's a lot like of family said, 20... history to dump on you, but there you go. Yeah, no, it's good. It's good. You're relating. That's good. Um, so like I said, 23, he's got a poli sci, he's a PhD. He's fluent in six languages, had seen half the world, was godsend to the president of China. So it's perhaps a like, yeah, duh, no shit turn of events that U.S. Army intelligence is yeah. going to come knocking. And they're like, hey, bro, Paul. Uh-huh. We got, we should talk, buddy. If you can speak Chinese and it's the 50s, the CIA is yeah. coming for you. Yeah. This is even earlier, actually. Oh, this is okay. like 30s. Because that's what, yeah, same with my grandpa. They're like, hmm, we need someone yeah. who's, anyway. And, if, and remember, his dad is like the, the advisor. So he's oh, like, that's he, right. he's, he knows all this stuff. It's not just like he speaks Chinese because like his parents put him in like a right. mommy and me class with like other Chinese kids who like speak Mandarin he's or whatever. He's on the it's inner like, circle. He's in the inner circle of like what the president, he's just like learning about all this stuff through osmosis, right? And his dad's like writing propaganda for the Chinese revolution. Like it's insane. He's just grown up in all this shit. It's insane. Yeah. So by this point, he gets, like I said, he gets recruited by US Army intelligence. And now he starts this period of his life where he's got like two careers going at the same time. He's an illustrator and a podcaster, double threat. (laughs) And, and an author. And that's right, and an author, <laughs> a traveling, pretty much a traveling salesman, which yes. is what we are. We figured that out yep. last convention. We're like, are we traveling salesmen? Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, we're just yes, like, we you are. step on up and get a picture of a cat. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you got a cat. Is that why you came to CatCon? How about uh, if I can interest you in a drawing made by the great Hannah Hillam, known throughout the Middle East as the Cat Whisperer? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> That was pretty similar. That energy you just gave was very similar to the energy you did at CatCon. Got to be, got to be aggressive. Professional. I try. I try. I know. Uh, no, he's not <laughs> podcasting. Unfortunately, fine. He would though if he were time. alive now. He probably would have. Yeah, yeah. he would have been like, I have some of the most interesting life experiences yeah. in the world. I'm going to make a podcast where I swear with my friends. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> but no, by the mid 1930s, he's got a sweet little academic career going at Duke. So he's like, whatever, teaching and like assistant professing and, and all that. And he's writing papers. Uh, he's also publishing books about East Asia because he's literally an expert. Mm-hmm. And he's also got this military gig going on. So he's earning a reserve commission and later going on to serve on active duty. And uh, with a bounty of academic, military and professional experience, Paul quickly became one of the country's foremost experts in psychological warfare. Okay. One more thing. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, it's, it's back great. to I'm my curious. grandpa. So yeah, yeah, yeah. a quick story. He 
did the Korean he enroll enrolled in the Korean War. <laughs> he enlisted. He served. <laughs> and they or enlisted, yeah. He went to Korea. He was like twenty something, twenty three or four. He went there and he, they get there and they start waiting for their assignments and they get to the end of the list and he's still sitting there. And they're like, Well we don't have an assignment for you. Uh we'll put you in propaganda. How about that? Oh shit. And so my grandpa created like leaflets that they dropped all over Vietnam. <laughs> Wait, really? Oh, in, v- in Vietnam or in Korea? Oh, uh, no, Korea. Sorry, in Korea. Okay, hold that thought. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> really? Okay. Yes. <laughs> hold, just hold it. I want to okay. know more, but let me... let me. That's all I okay. know. Oh, okay. I can find his memoirs. Shit. No, no, no. I, oh, my God. Uh, okay, wait. We're getting hype. Tell no, me. No, we're getting really excited. Tell okay, me. so becomes an expert on psychological warfare, and um, he's also, like, like, just super duper really hated communism, and would dedicate a lot of his work to trying to destroy it and take mm-hmm. it down. Um, and now this is where Paul's thinking to me gets really interesting because he recognized the U.S.'s disadvantage in the propaganda wars. And <laughs> this is where he starts to sort of split from his upbringing with his dad yeah. and he builds on new ideas brought about by people like Edward Bernays. Remember, Freud was like, like five seconds before this all happened, like all this idea of like psychology and like how the brain worked and like repressed childhood, whatever, like that's yeah. all relatively new. Like, and even the idea of, of pro- not propaganda, Very. but like public relations mm-hmm. and like how you interface with the public and use it and use psychology as a way to get people like to either purchase things or jump on board. Like that's brand new. That's like less than 20, 30 years old at this time as both as a profession and as a science and as a thing that people are studying. That's so crazy how um, young that is. Yeah, it's it's all like it's all in its infancy. So it's brand new in the popular imagination. And Paul believed that without dogma or class hatred, uh, American propagandists really didn't have great stories to tell to convince people to join their cause. And he saw it working for communists across the globe, spreading like wildfire. The stories were simple and they're clear and they're effective. Yeah. And, you know, it's just literally like, hey, there's capital and then there's everybody else. And the real enemy here is capital. And if capital doesn't yeah. have if they've got all, it's really clear. It's very emotional story. It's like a easy way to, like, get people hooked on it is sort of how because he's thinking about the mechanics of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also, don't forget, his godfather was once again, literally the <laughs> dude that founded the party that like Mao was fighting in the Chinese Civil War. He was like, dude, communism sucks. Wow. <laughs> We got to do something. He was on the ground. He was like at the source. That's crazy. Yeah. I am loving this. By the way, <laughs> good, I'm good. Yeah. in heaven right now. <laughs> I Perfect. love this. So he starts making the case that you can't just bombard people with whatever you want them to believe, as is the right. practice or was the practice of communist propaganda at the time, i.e., you tell a lie enough times and it eventually becomes the truth. You dismantle the credibility of everyone and everything around you. So you don't believe shit. It just sort of puts you into a state of like, I don't even know what the state's called, but it puts you in like a weird state where like you're just repetition, repetition, repetition. Right. You just repeat the lie, repeat the lie, repeat the lie. It's posters. It's it's cult of personality. It's all right. that kind of stuff. And he's like, no, dude, you can't do that. Uh, and we have to s- differentiate ourselves from the communists if we want to succeed. And you got to have your audience in mind when you're trying to come up with propaganda. And so he's like, and again, this is the first person that has this idea. And he's like, you got to picture a dude in your head. That's like, let's call him like Johnny propaganda. And <laughs> what's this dude's <laughs> Terrific sci-fi writer, Johnny propaganda, <laughs> Johnny propaganda. So he's like, no, he's like, he's just thinking of in the audience. He's like, okay, so you got to remember like Joe, the plumber or whatever. Yeah. He's just like, who's the guy you're trying to reach? His name is Johnny propaganda. What's this dude's inner life? What does he want? What's his favorite order at IHOP? What's on his Spotify 2024 wrapped playlist? Us. You got to like get it's into his us. mind. Right. <laughs> What podcasts is he listening to? How often is he listening listening to them? He's just like, you got to create like a psychological profile of the person that you're trying to reach and really think about who they are, what their loves are, what their desires are, what their what their interests are. And you got to like get in there and then meet them halfway. You got to meet them where they are. That is and, so crazy because like all those old magazines, the, the National Geographics, you can see how yeah. they didn't apply this to any advertising whatsoever. They would just have a full page with all the information about the product listed with a picture of it. Yeah. There was never any like, hey, housewives, we know you need this. It was just like, here's the info. Yeah. And never it was never like aimed at an audience in, in the way that it is now or even in the way that this sounds like it's going to be. 
Yeah. And so just a quick, did you ever read anything about Edward Bernays? No. I think he was Freud's nephew. Mm. Uh, and he wrote, I forgot what the book is that he wrote, but basically he invented like PR and like, like psychological advertising. Wild. The dude that did it. And like, there's a really famous story where I can't remember who it was. It was like, I don't know, Marlboro, some cigarette company was like, oh, we're declining in sales. And like, we're trying to get women to smoke um, because like they'll, it'll like, that's a part of the audience that like we're not capturing. So he like, he basically like made some like staged a parade. Bernays did. He like staged a parade and then like hired these like actresses to come like take their shirts off and like storm the parade and like yep. smoke cigarettes. And then he had like some <laughs> newspaper guy like take pictures of it. And they're like genius defiant women smoking cigarettes and like whatever, like disrupting this this parade and wearing their bra. And then like cigarette spike, cigarette sales spiked because suddenly the association with cigarettes was about how like, oh, it's like you don't do what your man tells you. you Women's smoke liberation. And, yeah. Yeah. It's like he's just sort of capitalizing off of it. I think also, if I'm not mistaken, once again, the Nazis, the Nazis like were like, dude, Edward Bernays has got some interesting writing. Great. Uh, and they used a lot of that. Anyway, that's an aside. Mm-hmm. That's that's like a relatively new idea at this point. So uh, Paul is like, we need to incorporate this into propaganda. But kind of to your point, um, it sounds insane, right? Because it's still, we're talking about propaganda and we're talking about overthrowing countries. But like, you know, I, I, I'm by no means an expert on this guy, but I, I get the sense that he's sort of an idealist. Yeah. I don't think that it was like this thing where he's like, I want to murder people and like exploit resources from. I think he's like he's raised in this mentality, in this sort of childhood of like he, he's an idealist. Like he's right. seen this man who's like, I'm going to go back and like consolidate China and make it this thing because we don't believe in like this former. Dynasty. Like he be- I think Paul he really believes in sort of the. If you think about like other inventors, like even Einstein, like with the with the yeah. splitting of the atom, he was like, I was just trying to figure it out, and now everyone's killing each other with it. <laughs> right, like, right. It's similar. I feel like it's similar to that, where it's like, oh, I didn't expect this to. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and and if and again, this is so insane to even say, but this dude literally, in terms of how to make psychological warfare more pointed is like, we need to really use empathy for this, which like I said, just sounds nuts, but that's, that's literally what he's talking about. Okay, guys, I know it's uncomfortable to care about yeah. others, but we have to p- pretend for a minute. Like, if you, un- if you understand your audience, they will respect you. And that's how we win hearts and minds. That's like wow. his big sort of thing that he says, again, totally twisted and insane and like so much to unpack. But that is the broad strokes of what he's sort of fighting for. Of course, after we drop the bombs and effectively end the reign of the Japanese Empire Mm -hmm. in 1945, East Asia suddenly becomes vulnerable to the intervention of communist regimes. Yes. Very famously. uh, So in the late 1940s, Paul goes on this like long road trip and he's tending to one communist insurgency after the next. And first he's like in Malaysia. He ran uh, psychological warfare operations in support of the British forces fighting oh. Chinese-led communist guerrillas. Then he goes to advise anti-communist efforts in Thailand, the Philippines, and in Indonesia. He's he's going all over the place. And occasionally, wow. he's even hopping back into China to help the nationalists from losing to the CCP because he's like, you know, that's when the Chinese Civil War is happening. Uh, and he's just like, no, I got to go in and pop. He's doing a lot of Southwest flights throughout all of East <laughs> Asia, like bouncing back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> Good airline, free suitcases. So- <laughs> bring Two all. Free pack- Chuck- yeah, bring whatever he wants. All of his propaganda stuff, and yeah. somehow between all of those overseas missions, he moved from Duke to the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and in 1948, literally writes the book on psychological warfare titled. You want to take a guess? Psychological warfare. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> Literally wrote the book called Psychological Warfare. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that book is floating around one of my family members' houses. It's still referenced today. Yeah. Uh, I've ob- seen that book. It's an important book. Obviously, I didn't have the time to read such a dense, huge book in time for yeah. this. But I know it's important, and I know that psychological warfare is uh, a big thing. So going back to your pamphlets. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So an, as an aside... From 1950 to 1952, Paul was deployed to Korea. Oh, my gosh. Late in the conflict, when Chinese soldiers began to surrender, they were approaching American troops with weapons still in hand. 
because dropping them was considered to be uh, dishonorable. Oh. So they wanted to give up. They were like, we surrender, but they weren't putting their guns down because culturally that was too much. Not a thing, yeah. And American soldiers, on the other hand, were like, these Chinese soldiers are walking towards us with their weapons. Right. We're going to shoot them. Um, and so they were killing all these Chinese dudes who were surrendering. Oh. And it, it wasn't good. So Leinbarger met with Chinese prisoners to devise a series of Chinese words a soldier could yell when he wished to surrender. Culturally acceptable words like love, virtue, and humanity that did not insult the soldier's honor, but when said together, were phonetically similar to the English words, I surrender. What? <laughs> Whoa, what? Okay, that's genius. That's, that's, that's genius. That's thinking outside the... That's what I'm saying. I'm like, that's serious. Like, that's big brain shit. That, that's not saved, like, that saved a lot of lives. And not by dropping a goddamn bomb on top of everybody right. he's like <laughs> teach him a lesson no yeah that was yeah, he's, like he's like yeah how about we meet them halfway and like yeah. come up with the, how about we do like the slightest bit of work to understand right. these people <laughs> man world war ii could have ended differently so pamphlets with explicit surrender no instructions way. were shot behind enemy lines and the number Dude. of botched surrender attempts decreased significantly okay those were the exact years he was there your grandfather was probably dropping those pamphlets. He was in charge of that. I'm ha I'm having a moment. <laughs> um, that's so cool. What? Okay, <laughs> I'm my mind is a little bit blown right now. I'm yeah, having a moment. He's um. I I just thought it was such an interesting approach to again psychological warfare. Yeah. Uh, he's a cool dude and but smart. Anyway. Smart, yeah, yeah. very much like he's a very, uh, as you can tell, he's a, you know, as you will learn, he's a prolific kind of not prolific, he's a very creative thinker. So, and after Korea, he heads back to John Hopkins to resume his teaching and researching duties. Because remember, he's he's sick a lot. Remember, he was like right. he's a sickly kid. He's not this dude who's like ripped and like in super good shape. He's sort of in and out of whatever. Um, <laughs> he's too busy using his brain so that his body can't necessarily catch up as much. <laughs> He can't just keep going into the jungle like, uh, what is it, God's Rambo. God's like Rambo. Yeah. <laughs> He's not fight. He can't keep fighting revolutionaries and like being in the jungle and stuff. He needs to rest. He needs, he needs to rest his frail body so his brain, his big brain can think of more ways to not kill Chinese, so many Chinese people. Yes. And remember, yeah. he needs rest. And he's like us. He cannot sit still. Oh. So it's when he's bedridden back home which was very often that this insanely prolific man begins a new hobby <laughs> after writing all these other books and like propaganda stuff. All, he like, starts another thing and politics. Yeah. He starts a new hobby, which is writing science fiction <laughs> stories. <laughs> what in the world? It's so, like, he's just like, this genius like politician like analyst or whatever and he's like you know what i'm gonna write about alien boobs because that's what they can't all were sit still can't sit well good look i deeply relate to that deeply deeply like even if i like what i'm doing i'm still like huh, gotta have something else you know yep, what's next yep. um yeah wow speaking of what's next no that's where i'm gonna leave this no. next week <laughs> I knew it was a two-parter, and that still really bummed me out. Um, I I was like, I could brush over, just sort of do a greatest hits of like some of the stuff, but I was like starting to read some of the bits of the stories, and I was like, these seem like there's quite a lot to unpack here, uh, and sort of how they tie into his. I was like, uh, that's why I was saying at the beginning, I'm like, oh, this should be a feature doc at the very yeah. least, if not like a thick biography. I'm, and I don't say that like. You know, fl flippantly, I feel no. like there's a substantial amount of stuff to unpack with this man's life and his personal experiences and how they play into his work. So I and actually just, did something yeah. I haven't done before for this show, which is I ordered um, a copy of like a best of collection of his short stories. Uh, awesome. Um, I am probably digging myself into a hole mm -hmm. that I won't be able to uh, fulfill by the next time we record. But I'm going to try to read at least we'll some of the... Best the bigger ones that are like a little bit more prominent and they're famous. I've already sort of looked at, I've glanced at sort of like the overviews of them and they, they're really strange. Ooh. They're not like, they're not um, the science fiction. They're not like Asimov or any of those guys. It's like a very different form of, of storytelling, which is why I was so interested in it. it so anyway, sense. he has a very different upbringing and background. 
Yeah, and I think the the whole idea of like of anyway, whatever. You know what? I'm not going to give it away in terms okay. of like what I think was was happening there, but I think next week I'm going to try to explain some of those stories and sort of talk about how I think they play into his broader life. Um, but he, he's genuinely like this, this guy is fascinating, and I don't know anything about him, and I hadn't heard anything about him, and I think there's a case to be made about. Like, uh, yeah, th- there's like a there's a bigger story here. Anyway, so. I love characters That's my like tap. this that are like you see there you see where they are in every era and yeah. how you know what I mean like uh, he's just a weird connector of so many yeah. things that you wouldn't expect the godson of yeah. the president of China yeah. <laughs> who invented modern psychological warfare <laughs> and then got sick and wrote sci-fi yeah who was like, actually, it seems like a kind-hearted idealist seems from like all an, accounts. Seems like a nice dude. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. On, but to, that, that's the funny thing, though, in terms of like a character study, right? Like hearing those things, you'd be like, oh, this guy's like intense and like wants to overthrow governments. No. Seems like he just was this very like, no, it's like, you know. Yeah. I, 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 we he's should brainy. help people by like not killing. Yeah, he's like a nerd for sure. Wow. Anyway, I'll get more into it next week. What a cool story. I'm yeah. very excited. I'm also still kind of reeling from the family connection. I can't. Yeah, quite, that's I can't so cool. quite get over that. There's that's a, awesome. There's a chance he maybe came across him in uh, excellent his time. Um, awesome. Woo. Anyway, um, thank that you. That is my tab. Why don't we go ahead and close up our windows? I'm going to close. Obviously, not all of them because I have to continue. Um, but what were you thinking for, I think it should oh. be like the sound of a Camaro with like gunshots going after yeah. it. That doesn't really sound like closing anything, but I just want that. Yeah, I want that. <laughs> we're not going to, well, it'll just run over the tabs. It'll peel out. <laughs> like, and then run away and then there's like distant gunshots. Yeah. Okay, perfect. You want to count this down? Yeah. Oh, I have to go find the tabs. Just a minute. Okay. Three, two, one. That was my car impression. Close. All right, it. moving on to listener emails. Yeah. I believe you're up first. I am up first. Okay, this is from Felix in Austria. Hey, Hannah and Kave. Greetings all the way from Vienna, Austria. Loving the pod. Love here's Vienna. A, here's a post about. Have you been? I've never been. Oh, it's a beautiful city. Really it's a beautiful. It's like the, one of the cleanest cities I've ever been to. Ooh. Yeah, Vienna's gorgeous. Gotta go. Here's a post about being buried in a bog that I tried sending Hannah on Instagram <laughs> without success. And it's just a picture of like what looks like melted puddle of human remains. <laughs> just, well, I'll put it up. But anyway, as for listener tab contributions, here is my tab. What's the worst that could happen picking the wrong song at karaoke night? Angry stares, disgusted faces, maybe a grunt or a sigh. Wrong. Filipinos take their karaoke very seriously. It's their national pastime, many passionate hobbyist singers being excellent at it. For performers and audience alike, following a karaoke etiquette is expected. Failing that can elicit strong reactions from karaoke enjoyers. In rare cases, those reactions can get really out of hand. Uh Uh-oh. In the so-called My Way killings between 2002... Oh, no. Have you heard of these? These are... No. Like Frank Sinatra My Way? Yes. This is absurd. Um... In the so-called My Way killings between 2002 and 2012, more than 10 people were reportedly killed in connection to singing Frank Sinatra's song, My Way. So there's a whole, this was this, this whole crazy, I've read about this before, where they're like, they, it would incense people so much that they'd sing, sing it wrong and then did the song itself that they would like literally murder each other. Dear Lord. Other countries aren't immune to karaoke related rage, though. Assault and even killings have been reported in other countries. Some examples are listed on the wiki page above. Looking forward to the, ne- the to the episode every week. Certainly looking differently at dams, barbed wire, and whales these days. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping it Josie in Austria, uh, Felix. Yeah, the Austria. my way, the my way killings. Good night, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put another shrimp on the barbie. Do you remember from Dumb and Dumber? Yes, I do. Yeah, okay, yes, it's a pop I culture do. reference. You remember? Uh, yep. This is why. I never do karaoke because I don't yeah. want to get killed. I don't want to die I mean, in that way. Yeah, in that way. I did karaoke at Chicago Comic Con and it was the first time I ever That's enjoyed right. it. What did you sing? <laughs> my way? No, I sing. <laughs> no, you sing the Limp Biscuit version of My Way. My yeah. Way or the Highway. <laughs> no, I sing, um, I sing Should I Stay or Should I Go by The Clash. 
Okay. And everyone made fun. Everyone was like, what is this? And I'm like, you know what it is. They didn't know should I stay they or should knew. I go? They knew, but they were all like, oh, you know, it was like kind of like a different path. Like there was, was a lot of like, like pop and like K-pop yeah. and, and, and stuff like that. So anyway. you were with young people. That was the problem. I was with like people in their 20s. Yeah, you can't, I was like, can't wow, karaoke you guys with people in their twenties and they'd be like, I don't know what any of these songs are. Yeah, no. Anyway, your turn. Um, cool. All right, moving on. Listener email number two is from oh. Dustin. Uh, is Dustin? I think so I know. Says, hey, Hannah. Not sure if this is you <laughs> or Kava say- reading this. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> not sure if this is you or Kava reading this. But Hannah was one of my best friends back in high school. Yes, we were. We were so scene partners. We both, you Dust- know, I said I won that Shakespeare competition. No, yeah, I got second yeah, yeah. place. He was the other. He and I both. He won, also got, is yeah. good at. What did Miles say? You're good at talking Shakespeare. I'm good at, he's also good at talking Shakespeare. <laughs> Justin, yeah. the the championship talking Shakespeare. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, we, I met Dustin when I was in sixth grade, and I first moved back to Utah, and we would just go jump on the trampoline next door all day. That That's sounds it. like fun. Yep. Um, sadly, we lost touch and haven't spoken in many years, but I love your podcast and I love seeing you succeed and doing yeah. something that you love and are clearly so good at. Anyways, I wanted to share one of my tabs. Just a quick note. No one is succeeding here, Dustin. No, dude, um, we're really, we're, just, we're scraping, <laughs> we're scraping by. <laughs> but if you want to go join the Patreon. <laughs> yeah, you can just help kidding. us succeed so like... that Dustin didn't make liars out of us. <laughs> I feel like icky asking one of my oldest friends to go give me money on Patreon. <laughs> Um, okay. I love archaeology and I read lots of stuff about it and have probably watched way too many documentaries about it. One that I have read about in many different places is King Tut's um, phallus. <laughs> when King Tut Classic. was first discovered, he was found to be mummified with an erect penis. <laughs> hey, look, if why not? You know? This was documented with pictures during the excavation in 1922. (laughs) Later on, the penis disappeared. Yeah, it did. And no one seemed to know where it went. (laughs) One theory is that Howard Carter, the man who found him, had accidentally broken it off (laughs) and it was taken by workers and sold on the black market. But in 2005, a team performed a CT scan of the mummy and they lifted it out of the sarcophagus they found the penis underneath. Oh. It truly had been broken off, but had just fallen below instead of being stolen, which, you know, sometimes it yeah. happens. Your penis falls off and you're just like, it's in <laughs> the couch cushions. You just sweep it under the rug. <laughs> yeah. You got to dig in. You yeah. find some change. The remote, you're broken off dick. <laughs> uh, broken off mummified penis. You just mummified you need penis. To toss it aside. Listen, don't eat it. That's all I'm going to say. Don't eat it. No. I know that you're uh, that there have been people who have done that. Archaeologists now think that the reason he was mummified with an erect penis was in response to his heretic father, uh, Aka Akenle, Akenaten. Do you know how to say this? Uh, where is it? Let's see. Um, Akenaten and Akenaten. Sorry, I didn't. Yeah. Re- I didn't Wait. do this in event. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Akenaten. I think Akenaten during his reign as pharaoh had abolished the long-held religion of Egypt and changed it to a monotheistic religion to worship the Aten the sun disc. Uh He was hated by the Egyptian people for this, and then he died. And King Tut returned the religion back in order to gain favor from the people. The god Osiris was one of the primary gods in Egypt and is the god of mummification Uh as well Uh as fertility. Osiris is depicted with green skin because he died and was the first being to be mummified. Whoa. Tut was also said to have been found covered in a resin that was black and made from Nile sediment that may have initially been green. It is thought that Tut being buried green and with an erect penis was done to connect him with Osiris and make a symbol of his return to the old religion. So he's a cosplaying in his grave. Apparently, yeah. Tut is the only known mummy to be buried with an erect penis. (laughs) Anyway, sorry for using the term erect penis (laughs) so much. (laughs) If you don't want to use this story on the show, I totally understand. Ha ha. Hannah, hope you're doing well. You're awesome. Dustin. And Dustin includes the link. Thanks, Dustin. Dustin, Thank you. We got to reconnect. We got to reconnect. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to do the Buster Bluth with an erect penis. Penis. (laughs) (laughs) How does he say it so like, like accusatory and breathlessly at the same time? So good. Oh, I love him. My father came back from a trip with a statue with an erect penis. (laughs) 
Anyway, if you uh, have an email that you'd like to submit to us, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Go in head, penis. Uh, please yep. <laughs> send us an email at 500opentabs at gmail.com. That's 500. Give us a brief explanation of what your tab is about. Mm-hmm. Please emphasis on the brief. No more than a couple of sentences, ideally. Oh, um, <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know or, that. I mean, sometimes they get long and if they don't qualify for a uh, full tab, uh, I feel bad because I'm like, okay, well, uh, we want to use some of these, but we need more of a summary of them sometimes. Um, anyway, there which not to say we don't appreciate the longer ones. They're good. They're just like, we can't read them online because yeah. they're too long. Um, anyway, <laughs> send us a uh, send us a summary. Send us your link. And of course, uh, let us know where you're from. And yeah, uh, what do we got coming up? We got a bunch of stuff happening. Um, oh, also, also. We are interested in still taking uh, voicemail submissions. Yeah. Uh, try to keep it to under a minute. We, we'd love to hear more voices other than the ones in our own head. But uh, Hannah, why don't you tell them, uh, what are we, this is like end of September. Yeah. Uh, so we got New York Comic Con coming up. That's mm-hmm. where we're going to be. 17th through the 20th, I want to say. Yeah. Uh, we'll have a table at C44. No, that was last year. Never mind. <laughs> Somewhere. Um, so yeah, we'll be at New York Comic Con. Uh, we'll be sharing a table. And, an artist uh, alley. An artist alley. And you got to come say hi. We'll yeah. be insane. Uh, uh, most likely. As always. And then I'll also yeah. be, I also have um, my book. Oh, and my book is coming out October 8th. And yeah. um, there's a signing at Book Passage uh, in San Francisco and also at Books Inc. in Palo Alto on the 8th and the 9th. And then at Vroman's in Pasadena on the 29th. You're also doing a signing at New York Comic Con, am I mistaken? Uh, yes, at the Comic Con itself, at the Hachette booth, the book in the, in the, yeah. in the writer's block area, I think. And then in uh, Salt Lake, I have a, a signing at the King's English on the 1st of November and the 26th of October. It is all out of order. 26th of October, I'm going to be at Powell's in Portland, Oregon. So, um, As such, Hannah's going to be on the road. Because she's too cool for us and she's going to be unable to record a couple of episodes. So we're going to have a couple of guests filling in for her for a couple of them. So keep a, what did I say earlier? I was like, <laughs> keep your ears unplugged, uncorked, uncorked. and your eyes peeled. Uh, we got some fun guests coming on. There's a couple of them that we've already figured out. I'm excited about them. I think you guys are going to have a, get a get big kick out of them. Um, but in the meantime, please, you know. Go sign up for the Patreon. It helps us. Yeah. Go sign up and subscribe to the YouTube. That really helps us. Please, um, you know, rate, rank, like, subscribe, whatever, yes. all that crap that we're supposed to say. You know what to do. You've yeah, you been know around. What to do. Just yeah. go like go, it everywhere and subscribe go, everywhere. Subscribe everywhere. Go sign up for the Discord, uh-huh. which is growing bigger by the day. It's fun um, over there. It's fun over there. And of course, um, thank you, Alyssa, as always. Thank you, for Alyssa. Putting an episode together for us. Uh, anything else you wanted to. Um, um, oh, I was going off? to say. Did you already say Patreon? We did say Patreon. Okay. We can say it again. Patreon, we got one. Patreon, there's lots of uh, extra clips on there. And I'll be adding more of like things we do talk about, but don't put in the episode um, riffing, et cetera. So. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, there's plenty of ways for you to continue enjoying our company when you're not just listening to this podcast, unfortunately yep. for you guys. Wow. So keep it going. We've tricked them. Yeah. Uh, I think that's it. All that's left to say is Segundus Nixon shat here five times. And I'm going to say Segundus Nixon shat here three times because that is the oh! original. That's true. That is yeah. the original. Five times uh, sounds better. It does. It's like 500 open tabs, 500 open (gasps) Segundus Segundus Nixon chat here 500 times. 500 open times. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yes, there it is. Anyway, thank you everybody for listening. Thank you, Hannah, for your tab. Salute to the people we talked about. Yeah.